welcome students and teachers to another session of um, uh, the Constitution and um, uh, an American Lives here, uh, or the Lives of America, or something like that. Sorry, we had a pre uh, a pre program meeting and uh, it discombobulated my mind. Uh, anyway, welcome uh, to all of you who are following the four Bs and the American Constitution. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind you, we have uh, Professor Tim Moore, an expert in both country music and uh, polka uh, music. And so if you have any questions about that, please uh, ask him. We have CC, who, uh, or Professor Chris Cavanaugh, whose interests include golf, fishing, and uh, origami. Uh, and he, he's not good at any of those, uh, but that's his uh, interest. And uh, we have Dr. Mike Williams, uh, who we're not going to pick on tonight because his Giants uh, lost last week and he's still in a pretty intense uh, uh, period of uh, depression. But tonight we are honored to have Professor Hank Chambers, a, a friend of the program, a friend of uh, uh, the Constitution, a law professor at the University of Richmond, and a passionate opponent of Duke University. Uh, he is here to discuss the second or third, I don't know, I want, the second or third founding uh, of the uh, Constitution uh, and the principle of uh, quality. Uh, it is the contention of this commentator, I'm not gonna include the rest, that the most challenging principle and value found in the American Constitution after 1868 is the concept or principle of equality. There is no doubt in my mind that for most of our history, it has been embedded in our system. That is equality, but also racism has been embedded in our system. Yes, I'm gonna say it systemic racism, all right, is part of the American story. Uh, and I don't think you can doubt that if you look at one, the institution of slavery, two, the institution of Jim Crow uh, there. Uh, and the question becomes, when we get the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, which are very important to Professor uh, uh, Mike Williams uh, there, when we get to that point, at what point, if any, did systemic racism cease uh, uh, to exist? One of the problems we face as we talk about equality is how is it defined? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Uh, that is, are we able to get our hands around this notion uh, of equality in such a consensus as a people uh, that we can possibly live uh, peacefully uh, together? Uh, it would seem that the 14th Amendment is pretty explicit. No state shall deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law. However, given today's debate over things like Black Lives Matter, the teaching of history and the law, which I'm sure Professor Chambers is very familiar with being from the state of Virginia and some of the interesting things going on in the governor's race with what is called CRT or critical race theory, a, a, a topic we did a segment on uh, this summer. Uh, there is no doubt that even after 153 years since the 14th Amendment has been ratified, that we are still struggling with obtaining the idea of equality under the law. So tonight we wanna to deal with a, a quotation by one of the great historians of Reconstruction, Eric Foner, where he says, During So the, to jump in until Dave picks up again, uh, for folks watching, he's starting to read the quote, I believe that is the main stem of the question. During the second founding, a new definition of American citizenship incorporating equal rights regardless of race was written into the Constitution. And where he was going to go with that after that, I am not really sure. So it is the contention of this host that the most challenging principle value found in the American Constitution after 1868 is this principle or concept of equality. There is no doubt in my mind that for most of our history, Racism has been embedded in our system. Yes, systemic racism cannot be denied. If you look at the institutions of slavery and Jim Crow, how can you deny that this system was built upon racism? We wonder at what point, if any, did the systemic racism diminish, especially after the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act? And that's gonna be one of the issues that we talk about when we look at this issue of equality. One of the problems we have, however, is defining what equality is. And we're gonna to try to address that uh, tonight. What is it, you know, what is it, what does equality look like and feel like 
uh, to Americans uh, in general. It would seem that the 14th Amendment was pretty explicit when it said that no state shall deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law. However, given today's debate over Black Lives Matter, the teaching of history and race in our schools, which Professor Chambers is probably very familiar with in the state of Virginia, given the governor's race that's uh, going on, uh, there is no doubt that even after 153 years since the ratification, that this issue question of equality is still at the forefront of the American experiment and the American native. I wanna to defer to the historian and the man who doesn't like presentism first, and that is to ask the question, Professor Moore, why didn't the framers address this in the original constitution? And, and just let me give some clarity here because there seems to be an obvious answer, but we're a very diverse group relatively speaking in 1787 all right religiously ethnically uh, uh we are a very diverse group so i'm wondering why there wasn't this notion of individual equality in the original constitution um well i i guess one thought i'd have on that is um uh, it's it's the uh, the infamous american f word federalism um there, I mean, at the in colonial and revolutionary times, the every state had these differing configurations of um, what citizenship was. Uh, well, certainly, uh, in the colonial era, there's no such thing as a citizen; they're all subjects. But, um, but during the revolutionary period, they start to wrestle with this notion of what citizenship means. Is does it transfer easily over from being British subject to being a citizen within the states? I think three of the uh, 13 constitution had these vague statements about citizenship and equality. Uh, there was this notion of uh, that there should be equal. Um, in, in British legal theory, it was called the right of migration. You don't lose any privileges and immunities if you move. And the colonials constantly argued that they gave up no rights just because they went across the pond. So. Um, so this transition into being states, the states have these differing configurations of what citizenship means. Um, and equality doesn't really factor into their equation much. Uh, property ownership equals um, is is kind of the configuration of if there's an equality among the states in, in terms of what citizenship means, it's property ownership, both in in terms of uh, property as well as persons. Um, and also, I think, they um there's this tacit understanding uh, that they're always there america early americans as well as revolutionary americans are very sensitive about being defined as inferior by the designation of being dominion um which in their mind is second class subjects uh so there's a sensitivity about being sense uh defined as second second class in british legal theory uh but the the convention wrestled with this notion of naturalized uh, is there such a thing as national citizenship and the answer was kind of a resounding no because all they talked about was privilege and immunities are they transferable across states and also um, whether there should be uh, a nationalization clause uh, or excuse me a naturalization clause which which they did have but there again um in the anti-federalist debates there's this discussion about can the national government i mean think about the irony of this there's actually a clause that says congress is in charge of it and yet during the ratification debates i think it's agrippa federal farmer uh they make the argument that we have to be we have to be very sensitive to how the states define naturalization and citizenship so even after we have a clause it seems to be quite clear who's in charge of naturalization uh, there's still some discussion about it. Now, I know I've kind of veered from the issue straight up to equality, but all, all I'm suggesting is if there's any notion of it, and I think there's minimal, it's tethered to this idea of who's a citizen. So, Professor Chambers, how do you square that circle? Is in, in the Declaration of Independence, we, we, team to, we seem to put an emphasis on we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet by the time we get to the Constitution, as Professor Morris said, we're somewhat silent. How do you square that sequel, that circle, and and what's your explanation uh, on top of Mr. Moore's of why we don't see it in the original Constitution? Well, 
couple things. One, I just want to make sure that everybody understands I do not hate Duke University. <laughs> it's a wonderful university. The Duke men's basketball program is a different story. I didn't say hate. I not, I, I, although I do not hate. Uh, I, I simply view them in an unequal fashion, 14th Amendment v. <laughs> so when we think about how we get to the Constitution and equality, we have to think about why government exists and why some people are outside of the circle and some people are inside of the circle and how they're outside of the circle and how they're inside of the circle. When we think about what a citizen is, essentially a citizen is one of those people who is inside of the circle. But again, the definition in this, I think is what, what Tim was getting at is, the definition of who's in the circle depends on who's defining what the circle is. And if the state gets to define what the circle is, then different states will define it in different ways. So when state citizenship was the key, you're going to have a whole bunch of different visions of what citizenship looks like. When national citizenship starts to become the key, then the notion is, OK, the federal government defines it. So I would view naturalization as arguably being a little bit different, in part because there are a couple weird things going on. One weird thing is we know we're going to have new states made out of areas that are not currently within the United States. So it does raise the question of, well, how do we think about the issue of citizenship when we're likely going to append areas, call them states, and welcome them into the union? Texas is a good example. Right? California is a good example. Places that were places before they became a part of the United States, Hawaii, right? All of those are, are, are places that had a political culture. So it's a little odd to say single definition of citizenship when you've got very different ideas of political culture. I agree completely that the idea of equality didn't really fit in. And I'll just give you an example. That is, women were citizens, but they clearly were not given the, 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 what we would consider to be the rights of citizenship in many jurisdictions. In some jurisdictions, they were, depending on their circumstances, but they weren't generally treated as being citizens who had the same rights as others. Now, we can either say that they were treated as second-class citizens, or we can go in the opposite direction and say the rights that we say are rights of citizenship could not have been the rights of citizenship because not all citizens were able to exercise them. I don't really care how you do it, but the notion of equality is really not one that was embedded in citizenship really until well after even, I'd say, the 14th, the 14th Amendment and 15th Amendment. In that vein, I want to add a, a couple of, of pieces of the puzzle, which I think students want to be careful about and i know you know this but you were going quickly so you didn't make the, the distinction we're talking about the 14th amendment you mentioned the civil rights act of 1964 which of course was passed under the commerce clause piece not on the 14th amendment because of state action issues and then you mentioned the 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 voting rights act which of course was passed really pursuant to the 15th amendment as opposed to the 14th amendment um so looking at where the, what the pedigree is for where we even get fairness is a really interesting question uh sort of sort of moving moving forward and i realize i jumped off of the question but i just wanted to to make those those points uh, but really really good stuff that that just makes you a full member of the four b's uh by uh, by by doing that uh professor kevin i wanted to ask first off are are you are you with uh, uh, Eric Foner? Uh, do you agree with him? He's not uh, here right now. But... <laughs> no, he's he's not. Uh, he was here earlier. But do you agree with his contention? I.e., the quote, Mr. This... Cubs fan. Uh, do you agree with his contention that this is a second founding? And then the second part, I, I'm curious. Well, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's yeah, a well, uh, let me two a couple of things here. Um, one is I think. When you allude to the declaration i would and students probably know this and their teachers know this to look at the virginia declaration of rights because mason puts in the weasel words when you enter into a state of society knowing full well that free blacks and women will never enter into a state of society so they will never be considered equal 
in the state of Virginia. Uh, so that's I think that's important because the Virginia Declaration of Rights is published before the Declaration of Independence. And um, actually, uh, what uh, Professor Chambers just alluded to, there's a case uh, that involves uh, um, um, a, a woman trying women trying to vote in the 1870s. And the Supreme Court actually says women like children are citizens. However, they're not given the full right. They, they, they don't get the right to vote. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there. So that's actually a quote from the Supreme Court. And do I agree with uh, Professor Foner? I, 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 think, I think I would qualify his quote and say this, David, that there was a chance for a second founding. We had a window, right? We had a window where we had people in Congress, authors of the 14th Amendment for sure, um, that were prepared to a degree to move us forward, right? But as we know, when we get to the election of 76, uh, it falls apart. So I, I think we had a chance for a second founding. Um, and I do think that reconstruction is a time period that I wish teachers uh, would focus more on in classrooms right now. So I would say, well, go ahead with your second part of your question. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious, what, what does he mean by a second founding? Well, I would, I would go with um, I, I, a great quote from Thurgood Marshall during the bicentennial of the Constitution. You know, people are like, oh, the Constitution, you know, is a wonderful thing. And Thurgood Marshall, uh, clearly his perspective was way different than a lot of Americans, given his uh, life story. Um, but he said the Constitution did not survive the Civil War. In his place was a new document, the 14th Amendment. And that new document, the 14th Amendment, gave us the ability to move forward where the framers fell short, and that is the idea of equality before the law. Well, it, it does on paper, but you know, I, I think we'd all agree that in reality, that founding does not flower for at least a hundred years. Well, so, that, well, see, that's why we go back to say. I mean, if you look at um, uh, the great PBS series on the Reconstruction, um, uh, Professor, uh, help me out, Skip. Um, Gates. Gates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really good and uh, for, for teachers to check that out as well. It's really good. But there was a small window, 18 post-Civil War up to about, you know, the 1877 or so, where we see we're moving forward. And you've got like, you think about Ulysses S. Grant and, and they're using the Ku Klux Klan Act to go into South Carolina and put the smack down on people. So we had a federal government. We had people in Washington that are willing to move us forward. But then we get to a point and we say, you know what? No, you people that rebelled from the union, you can be back in charge and we're going to go back to business as usual and maybe even worse than it was. So I think there's a small window of time where we had a chance. We just never actually followed through with it. Professor Williams, this has been an area in which uh, we've had a lot of fun with because your argument is that founding really doesn't occur until 64, 65. So do you think that Foner's notion that, you know, we have this founding in 1868 is, is at least historically legitimate? Yeah. Going back to our pre-production meetings, it kind of means what, what, what do you mean by founding? Um, I think that, I mean, I think it's important what the, what the Civil War Amendments do, an Equal Protection Clause do, does, is it gets the soil ready for the, the growing of what's gonna become real equal protection under the law. And without that written into the text, you know, our civil rights leaders in the 20th centuries, they don't have that sort of political tradition and that constitutional text to go back to. So while I agree that what happened after the Civil War was not a founding, it laid the foundation for it for sure. I'm not sure if we get the 60, I'm not even, even with the Commerce Clause, right? I'm not sure if we have the political culture um, to make the argument of equality in the way that Martin Luther King and others were able to do in the 1950s and 60s without it being part of our political history. So Professor I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to pose it and come, uh, propose a definition. Um, it seems to me when I look at the founding, I don't know whether I believe this, but let's try this out. Uh, that the first founding uh, seems to be like three three sequences, three phases. There's a set of ideas 
uh, it creates an, an inevitable conflict and there's to some degree a resolution. Uh, so if that, if, if my framework is, is um, and like I said, I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head, I'm not sure that um, the second founding that Foner's referencing has, has the resolution uh, to, to Mike's point that he's made um, in many of these that the resolution doesn't come and maybe not even come until 1965. So uh, I don't know whether ideas, conflict, resolution is a, is a framework to think about founding or not, um, but it, it might be. I, I want to like ask, well, and I know you want to respond, uh, Hank, but, and, and I, I want you to, but I also want to give you something to, to roll with, and that is Tim kind of mentioned it. Is there a difference, in your opinion, between layman's understanding of equality, you know, uh, both within the Declaration of the 14th Amendment and the legal principle of equality? Is there a difference there? And is that part of our struggle? I, I, I'm certain it is part of the struggle in that if we talk about equal protection itself, we're still generally talking about equal protection with respect to a certain class of rights at least as of the, the 1860s, 1870s, and even into the, into the 1900s. So the idea of equality is still equality with respect to certain things, not just 100% equality. Now, I, I, I'm gonna go backward for just a moment and, and actually take issue with all of, all of my other four Bs. And that is, I suspect that this may not be Foner's point, but the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments create a second founding because it puts the country on a completely different structure. That is, there at least was the argument before the Civil War that the United States was a grouping of relatively independent states who had joined together as a union they had voluntarily come in, and at least there was a theoretical argument that they could voluntarily leave, theoretical. Post-Civil War with the Reconstruction Amendments, and I always call them the Reconstruction Amendments because I think that they were there to reconstruct the Union. The Union was reconstructed on a very different structure, a structure where the states were clearly subservient to the federal government, now really the national government. So even leaving the question of equality to the side, it looks to me like it's a different structure. Now, if you want to talk about equality and fairness, I'll say the other way we can make the argument about why it's a second founding, even though it's a highly imperfect one, is the term we the people now means something different. Before the Reconstruction Amendments, the argument was, yes, we the people may have constituted the Constitution, but but we still recognize that it was a state-based system. There's a pretty decent argument after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, particularly in the way that now the federal government clearly has power over the state governments in a way that they didn't have power over them before, particularly now that Congress is allowed to enforce the 13th Amendment, enforce the 14th Amendment, and enforce the 15th Amendment directly against the states. It suggests that the people are the actual units of the national government. Even though it's imperfect, that at least is a completely different way of viewing the union than it was beforehand. So it may well be that that's really part of what Foner is saying is no one's saying it was perfect, no one's saying that it came into full flower, but at least the way we look at the United States changed after we add the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. I'll step down for, for a moment and, uh, and take the arrows or duck them as the case may be. Well, okay. actually, I think uh, I'm, with, I'm going to support that. I, I really like the way you, that that argument, but it because for uh, students, if you think about it, prior to the Civil War, the verb when people referred to it was a singular verb, right? Or a plural verb, excuse me. The United when people refer to the country, they the United States are. After the Civil War, the verb becomes the United States is. So the verbiage the verbiage even changes because of that power structure. That, that, that Professor Chambers was alluding to has been solved allegedly for the time being. So I, I am just in support of what your 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 premise is. Dr. Williams. 
I'm gonna, I, I don't think I should be doing this. I wanna push back a little bit, just in terms of, I mean, it's the in theory part of this. Yeah, in theory, the reconstruction amendments set up a whole different structure. But for, for black citizens in 1895, with those reconstruction amendments sitting there, while they're not, they're not suffering under slavery, they're still suffering under um, gross, gross repression and inequalities. And it, it took a matter of sort of political and civic force to bring life to that. So we, we, we lasted about a hundred years with those reconstruction amendments where we can argue they didn't live up to what they were supposed to do in theory, which, which makes me just wonder about whether it's fair to call what happened at that moment, the second founding, or whether we should really have that privilege go to the 1960s. I don't know. I, which, which, is, which is fair, but if we're, but if we're gonna do that, then, then we as guys really need to shut up about any foundings at all with respect to women, right? I mean, so, so it's kind of hard to, to, I mean, that's why I go with the imperfect, because of course, many people now would say, the 14th Amendment still doesn't protect us in, in, in a sufficient fashion. That's and good news knows the 15th Amendment doesn't seem to protect us in sufficient fashion either, given what the court's doing with voting rights. So I, I, I hear you, but that's why I go with the imperfect, um, because heck, I'm not even sure what the original founding gets us if we really want to talk about equality. Professor Moore. Well, I'm intrigued. Uh, I'm intrigued, uh, Hank, at your. Uh, I mean, you did use the word. There's this structural change, um, and I and I I understand uh, what that means. But I'm often um, I often wrestle with the idea of structure versus daily living, um, and I think this this may be to Mike's point as well. That you mean, okay, you get this structural change, and we can call that an, a new constitution or a new founding, but uh you know jim crow uh, i mean the, the plessy decisions have been referenced uh i don't know that anybody's living like there's a new founding so i, I guess as a historian i'm a little leery of the the legal structural uh, uh argument as opposed to how people are actually living with the principles in the founding and, and arguably our first founding wasn't a founding then either if 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 we are uh, committed to the declaration having this foundational principle of equality so I, i'm i'm just uh, i'm often struck by the at least for me there's a disconnect between these structural arguments these legal arguments and how people live it doesn't so, seem to be much of a f influential founding then so 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 i can i can see kavanaugh's about to go nuts and it, it's it's funny because i keep looking at at your shirt and realizing that avid backward is diva but chris is no diva nonetheless <laughs> I am sure that Chris is going to say, Tim, what in God's name are you talking about? The 13th Amendment ended slavery. Have you lost your mind when you talk about no difference between pre-Reconstruction between pre -reconstruction Amendments and post it? Don't but, tell me that day-to-day -day existence did not change in the wake of the 13th Amendment. You just can't have that one. So putting aside, and here's the thing, you won't, you putting won't, aside you won't slavery, you won't give me Jim Crow or black codes or, I, I, or lynching. I, I, will, I, mean, I will give you Jim Crow, but you cannot, you could not walk up to a former slave in 1870 and say, your life hasn't really changed much, has it? Because their response would be, mm, yeah, it really kind of has. It's not perfect. It's not even close. In fact, it's not a quality in any real fashion but i'll still take post-slavery over pre-slavery so at least in that respect that is a sea change there's a reason why we celebrate juneteenth even though i think we probably shouldn't celebrate juneteenth the way we really do because the emancipation proclamation was not the 13th amendment nonetheless there's a reason why we celebrate juneteenth how, how we do, it's because at least for a significant group of folks, the end of slavery in and of itself meant something. There is something fundamentally different about a society that doesn't have slavery 
something fundamentally different about that society than a society that does have slavery. That is a, a society that that even talks a cruddy game about equality is still fundamentally different when it doesn't have slavery, even if you're trying to, even if you have things like slave codes, right? So, so no one's saying that that it's all sunshine and light and that and that unicorns are pooping rainbows. No one's saying that. But what we are saying is that it is it is fundamentally different structurally after the 13th, 14th Amendment than before. I mean, think, just go back and read the Constitution before the 13th Amendment and at, 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 and let me be clear, I'm not saying you haven't. So let me just, uh, but, but, but think about the Constitution before the 13th Amendment and how that United States was set up versus what the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments do in terms of how it sets up that particular government. It, it just seems as though it's night and day, even if we don't actually follow through with what we're supposed to do. So I, I, I hear what y'all are saying. It, it's, it, was not, it was not great, but frankly, there's some folks out there, particularly some CRT folks who would say the 14th and 15th Amendments, uh, sorry, the, the, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, that wasn't rainbow and, sun, and, and sunshine either. It's not like the early 70s were, were the halcyon days of yore. Those weren't great either. So, so it's a, heck, there's some people who say right now is not great for some folks who are here, some of whom are citizens, some of whom may not be documented. So it's not clear that the 14th Amendment has done all of its work yet, but I think we'd still say clearly it is structurally different now and both structurally and and substantively different now well i'm not i'm not that. arguing the structural because I, I mean that's that's an easy one I, I think there is i agree with you that there is a structural change a massive structural change i guess i'm just wondering if uh, the exodusters would uh, would answer your question uh that, that their life is different or or anybody who gets lynched any um in the late 1800s or early 1900s right, we, we've got to go to kavanaugh because i'm yeah, afraid okay, he's sorry. gonna go up, no well, up i mean, leg, I, mean up, I did not realize that this was diva backward <laughs> uh, 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 that was that's nice I, I didn't even realize that so that's um anyway so for all the teachers that may be watching this to teach uh, avid programs take that for, with a grain of salt i suppose but um you know, thank you, Hank, for the 13th Amendment, because I was about to lose my mind on that one, because there's slavery and there's not slavery. I mean, period. Right. It's kind of like our pre-production discussion about something else. You either are or you aren't. Um, but the other aspect, and I've said this before, it did change for people for a brief window of time for a black community in the South. It did change because you, if you look at uh, you know the black middle class is going to be created for a small window of time. You look at Webb Du Bois and look at the work that he is that he did in the South prior to Jim Crow taking hold. There was a small window of time where it did change for people, but the thing is, we did not have the fortitude to follow through with it. When I say we, I mean the federal government and the rest of the nation, right? We, 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 were, we talked a good game for about 25 years or less than, and then we said, okay, now we're going to go back. So there was, it did change for people on the ground. And, and certainly the abolishment of slavery, um, you know, obviously with the institution of Jim Crow and sharecropping that takes hold within the South, you have some people that aren't, for, you know, they're not too far removed from where they were, but there was a window. That's my point. There was a window for people and we closed it right and, and, let, and let me add let me add one couple pieces of the of the puzzle and and this is one where you do have to go and and think about what's happening on the ground so my father's parents were born in 1908 and 1911 in south side of virginia I can guarantee you that they were much better off than their parents. My mother was born in 1935. My father was born in 1937. 
they were much better off than their parents. My father served, and in, in fact, I, I, we, we were cleaning out his house, God rest his soul, he passed away a year and a half ago. We were cleaning out his house, and I picked up his dog tags. He was drafted into Uncle Sam's army in 1961 and served from 1961 to 1963 before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He would never have said that he was not in, in clearly better off than his folks. Things were moving in a better direction. They were not where they should have been, but they were moving in a better direction. So I'm not sure that 64 and 65 were nearly the, the clear issue that a lot of folks think they were. Because I know enough, enough folks who were adults, and I know enough black folks who were adults before 64 and 65 to know that their thoughts were changing over time and they were still in better shape than their parents, et cetera, and so forth. So I hear all of, all of it. It's a process. And America gets better, not fast enough, not fully enough, but it gets better. It's not a straight line. Right. And, and, and I'm not a big fan of the Martin Luther King Jr. line that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice because it certainly doesn't bend there directly. And I think that's that's part of Chris's point. Right. That there was a window where things really could have gotten much better. That window shut. Took us backward. And then from that shut area, we slowly started coming forward. We didn't get to where we should have been, but we're moving in that direction. So that's kind of the way that I, that, that I look at it. Uh, all that being said that, no, we don't have a good definition of equality. We didn't then, we frankly still don't now, uh, particularly if you're looking at the, the poor, for example, um, and, and whether the poor should, for example, be a discrete and insular minority, right? We have a lot of issues under the 14th Amendment that are not covered. Uh, so it's, it's, that's one of the reasons why it's still such a fascinating issue. But I think that that's kind of what Foner was 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 thinking about in his in his structure. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Dr. Williams, uh, thoughts? Yeah, um, I guess to me that it comes back to like what are we saying is being founded? Um, because I, I feel like the the arguments kind of uh, if there's an argument of was life was the political life and civic life better after the reconstruction amendments or before i think that we're that's clear right i think that we can make that argument but my students sometimes confuse the end of the civil war with that there's real liberal democracy in america and to me liberal democracy we can't say say with a straight face that liberal democracy even exists in theory until 1965. like we just can't do it because not everyone's getting the right to vote the 14th amendment doesn't talk about equality it talks about equal protection of the laws and to me, this is where I don't know if in 2021, there's real equal protection of the laws, because we all know that the individuals that have more resources, right? You just were talking about, about the marginalized and the poor, hey? We know that in, the, in the, the criminal justice system, it's not equal protection of the laws at all. We know that there has been no one charged for any crime for what happened with the Great Recession, not one, right? And we know that laws were broken. So to me, it's like, what are we founding? Are we finding a liberal democracy? Are we finding a society that where equal protection of the laws is more than just words on a page? It's an actual lived experience. Um, I think we're, I think we're closer, but I don't think that the Reconstruction Amendments get us there. It makes me think of like in international relations. We often talked about the difference of the absence of war does not mean that there's peace, right? So the absence of slavery doesn't mean that there is necessarily equality. And I know Hank and others, you're not saying that, but the, the right. So I'm more looking for like, when does it become part of the daily lives to borrow Tim's kind of framing of it? Well, um, I, I think of, I mean, I, I really appreciate what Hank said It's a process. It's going to be a more perfect union, right? Knowing that it's an ongoing process. And I always 
like just today talking in class, talked about the Magna Carta a little bit and, you know, who is, its rights for nobles, but it does plant a seed, right? The Declaration of Independence written by an enslaver or drafted by an enslaver, right? It plants the seed. The 14th Amendment, it plants the seed. So without these plateaus or these you know, junctions or whatever you would like to call them, we don't, it moves us forward and we go forward with fits and starts. So yeah, we're not there yet. Well, I, and I we don't, a, no, go ahead, I'll finish Chris, I'm sorry. No, no, I just, we just have, a, we still have a long way to go. And it seems like lately we've been, we've been backsliding. And if you- Yeah, and, 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 and there is, there is my struggle. I mean, I go back to, uh, oh gosh, uh, to, um, to Thurgood Marshall, and help me out i'm forgetting the female who was they attempted to integrate in the university of mississippi back in the 50s and in a press conference he you know the, the reporter asked him you know because moderates believe in gradualism you know we, we can't force this too quick we we've got to gradually change which is what i'm hearing here and 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 marshall says you know i believe in gradualism as well but 90 odd years is gradual enough now that was in that was in the uh, you know early fifties. It's now twenty twenty one, and and we're you're still talking about a process here, and and, and I guess that's where my frustration uh, comes up is uh, well how long is it is the process? And I'm talking about the law, and you know and and how the law should be applied. We still seem to be having the same discussions that we were having fifty years ago. Well, it's, I, 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 in my old civil rights unit, I used to teach an old black folk tale about uh, the goose and the fox, and it, it's a primary source. I forget the I forget the source off the top of my head, but the uh, fox comes upon the goose, and the goose flies up in the tree, and the fox says, "Hey, haven't you heard about the meeting of all the animals down at the hall the other night? They promised that no animal is supposed to hurt another animal." And the fox is trying to convince the goose to come down in the background. He, the 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 fox hears the dog barking and it's getting closer and closer and eventually the fox starts to slink off and the goose says wait a minute all right i thought you there was a meeting up at the hall then why are you worried about the dog and and the fox says well some animals around here don't have much respect for the law right and so the idea is that yes and i i do the same example with my students in class if you have a driver's license stand up if you always drive the speed limit remain standing and of course, nobody remains standing, so they all sit down. So you're, you're all lawbreakers. You have no respect for the law. And so we can write the words on the paper, but how do you change people's minds? We're dealing with 200, uh, how many years of racism? David, you alluded to this, and I would agree with you that the history of our nation is a history of racism and sexism, or the history of overcoming racism and sexism. And that takes a long time. So we can write the beautiful 14th Amendment, we can write the Voting Rights Act, we can write the Civil Rights Act, but until you, how do you change people's minds? How do you change what's in their hearts? And this is what I'm talking about, we're backsliding. And because we've allowed, we've allowed oxygen in the room for ideas that we thought were, we had gotten rid of. And I, and I see that Tim and Mike both wanna jump in and I'm hoping along the way, is, is this still, something a quagmire of our understanding of equality of opportunity versus equality of condition are, are we still stuck in that debate and that's just something to consider because i think we're going to free flow here for a while so professor moore um okay so we'll table that question because uh yeah. i what i um i couldn't help but think i couldn't help but think in some of our discussion um about the abolitionist movement there were some who were me some immediatists and some were gradualists i think um you know and and i think the um the the moral um stiffness of the immediatists was the subject of a lot of derision amongst the gradualists that they were idealistic that they uh you know that they uh, didn't understand uh, the way institutions or human nature worked. Uh, so I, as, as we were talking there for that 15, 20 minutes, I, I kind of heard some of that, some echoes of that division uh, about whether things can occur immediately or, or quickly. Uh, 
or does it take time? And, and I think the, the moral perfectionism of some um, movements and, and maybe even the civil rights movement, there are those that want to insist on more perfectionism now uh, versus some are willing to accept um, some faults in humans and institutions and hope for the best. So I, I guess I heard vestiges of that um, uh, early 19th century debates amongst the abolitionists. Professor Williams? No, I'm good, actually. Let Hank get back in. I wasn't going to say anything. So, so I, I, I hear what Tim is saying. I do think that there's a difference between folks who argue for immediate subconstitutional change and those folks who are arguing that the Constitution itself needs to be fully enforced as of the day that it is right. uh, uh, ratified. So, so for those folks who are saying, well, I think we ought to abolish slavery at the state level, understandable. But I don't think we would consider folks who say who who after the 13th Amendment was passed say, okay, we've got to in fact get rid of slavery right. anywhere where it happens to be. I, I I view them a little bit a little bit differently. Here's here's one of the the pieces of the puzzle that I'll that I'll add. Uh, as well, and that is, you know, I mentioned my my mother. In 1952, she went off to the University of Michigan to uh, as an undergraduate. After a year, she ran out of money, came back, and went to Howard University. But the the idea that some states were perfectly fine with having black students in higher education, and other states, namely southern states, many of them. We're not fine. It's kind of an interesting question. Eighty years after, or or ninety years after, the thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth amendments were passed, uh, and 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 that sort of raises a, an, an interesting question. In that vein, let me ask yet another question about foundings, because we do seem to think that we know what the first founding was. <laughs> so let me just go ahead and go back and go. No. If you really want to talk about the first founding, then I guess you'd have to talk about the Articles of Confederation. Or, or you could even go back and say, if you read the Declaration in a particular fashion, they are saying that we are the United States of America. I realize it's a small you united, but arguably they're saying we are some kind of group or loosely affiliated gang for purposes of breaking away from England. At the very least, you'd have to say that the Articles of Confederation, which explicitly call it a confederation and name it the United States of America, I guess we'd have to call that really the first founding. And then the Constitution would really be the second founding. And we could argue that it was the second founding because at least there wasn't the language about every state is completely independent. So we arguably at least move to a theoretical federation as opposed to a clear and unquestionable confederation. And then in theory, we could say the third founding was really the structural change after the Civil War where it became clear, you're like the Hotel California. <laughs> you can check out, you can never leave. So in, in that vein, it may be that, that, that if we are certain about what the first founding is, then I'm perfectly fine with saying the Reconstruction Amendments are the second founding. If, on the other hand, we say we're not sure that, this, that the Reconstruction Amendments trigger a second founding, then I would say that we have no idea what the first founding was. So right. you can have one or the other, but doggone it, you can't have both. And to make it even messier, I mean, it might be the Articles of Association 74 is our first constitution, uh, you know, the boycott uh, agreements. So. I just I just hope that some students work in uh, Hank's quote from the Eagles about the Hotel <laughs> California because if any students are watching this you can quote Professor Chambers a scholar within the network and 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 quote the Eagles at the same time that's that'd be wonderful it's okay absolutely Mike Ed, you asked David about equality of opportunity versus equality of condition I where where I'm sitting now at University of San Diego what I've noticed the last I think it's been five to 10 years. Um, the language the students are using, a lot of faculty members, is not either one of those, right? It's about equity. And, and e equality, and Hank, 
can articulate this probably much better than I can. Equality is like under the laws, like that people similarly situated get treated the same, right? So if you have oppression for 400 years and then you say, okay, everyone, everyone's gonna be equal. Well, even those terms are not gonna get maybe to where we think we should be as a just society. Now, to me, what was really fascinating about the reconstruction period is that it was, it was basically a military occupation that was in, it was it was in charge of equity. I mean, equity is moving resources from some to others for some moral or political or economic reason, right? And to me, the, the issue with equity that we are going to have to deal with in this century, I think, is to what extent can you practice equity and still maintain the other democratic principles that are important to you? Because to some extent, if you're thinking about equity, you're thinking about um, treating others maybe unequally. Um, Mike, Mike can I ask just for a clarification? Because again, I'm the least educated here. Isn't equ isn't equity synonymous with equality of condition? Isn't it outcome based? I, equality that of might condition. depend on who you ask. I guess so. Well, yeah, that's why I asked. I got four smart people here. He says it's not about this, and I agree, that's probably simple terms, equality of opportunity, equality of condition. But my understanding of equality of condition was somewhat outcome-based. Yeah. And equity, at least as I understand it, being talked about uh, in the world today, is similarly outcome-based. Fair enough. It, or my, and, it, and I could be wrong, because I'm wrong 10 times a day. So I'm just curious about that. No, I was just responding to the language that I'm hearing and that I use. And I don't use equality of opportunity or quality of condition. So yeah, I think that's a fair, it's a fair way to think about it. I, I, I think it is fair way. It, it's, it's fair way. I do think that Tim's right that it depends on who you talk to. That is, I, I think some people would say that equality of condition is the necessary result of long-term equity. And so if you're not, so you, you can you can kind of be equitable and, and moving toward equality of condition, at least in terms of some things. But, but at the very least, we don't wanna just talk about equality of opportunity when equality of opportunity almost necessarily means that you're not really looking at a quality of real opportunity. So talking about equality of opportunity, when you have one family that has several million dollars and the other family has, <laughs> so, sorry kids, doesn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, seems a little odd. But that's really what arguably we're seeing with equality under the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Others argue, well, hold on a second, given what we saw in the wake of the Civil War, for example, with Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau, et cetera, maybe the 14th Amendment has something a little more like equity built into it mm -hmm. than just formal equality. Right. Yeah. And that's a, fair, that's a fair piece of the puzzle. And in fact, I'll give you a parallel that can get kind of messy as well. The parallel is to partisan redistricting and gerrymandering. That is, if, if the notion is all we're looking at is whether everyone can vote, not at whether a legislature can actually do a job consistent with the votes that were cast, then that arguably is a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of condition. The Supreme Court has clearly said that it is looking at equality of opportunity. That is, hey, does everyone get to vote? And it's not really looking at the other stuff, at least unless you're talking about pure Voting Rights Act stuff, not the 14th Amendment kind of stuff. Because remember, of course, the Voting Rights Act stuff is race-based. Partisan gerrymandering is not race is, is not necessarily related to race-based stuff. So there's kind of an interesting parallel there. Yeah. In that vein, consider the issue of what qualifies as equality or liberal democracy in the context of the federal government when we talk about the US Senate. 
that is to say, when you look at the U.S. Senate and, and, and recognize that, that people oftentimes argue, the argument is, look at California versus Wyoming. Wyoming has 160th the population of California. Isn't that unfair? Yes, let me give you a different number that I hope people will start using because it actually gets at the issue a little bit more. And that is, if you add the populations of the smallest 20 states, that still is a smaller number than the population of California. So the 40 senators from the 20 smallest states still represent fewer people than the two senators from California. That's an issue. And that's an issue that has to make us think about what does equality mean and do we actually care about equality to the extent that the structure of the federal government and the passing of legislation requires that one go through a clearly inequitable body in order to get legislation? Those are some really big questions that we can ask when we talk about equality and what equality versus equity means both in the state sense and in the citizen sense. So, Professor I just, Chambers- I just, want to, I just want to go on record here saying I feel vindicated for all my rants about the Senate. Thank you very much, Professor Chambers. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Professor Chambers has identified, I think, one of a myriad of issues uh, dealing with equality today. And kids and students are, are being asked. Yeah, Chris? I just want to uh, go back to uh, 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 Fisher versus Texas, which was a pretty important case in terms of affirmative action to look at the admission of uh, a young woman to the University of Texas. She did not qualify. Um, and for students to talk about equality of condition versus equality of opportunity um, in the state of Texas, if you graduated in the top 10 percent of your class, no matter where you went to high school, you were granted admission to the University of Texas understanding that some schools are better off than others so they're actually comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges so if you're in the top 10 percent no matter where you went not compared to poor school versus wealthy school then you were granted admission to the you were granted admission to ut so that's a good case for maybe if kids are getting into looking at uh equality of condition versus equality of opportunity, I would uh, recommend uh, Fisher versus Texas. It gets, a little, it gets a little murky because there's like round one and then there's round two, but there's definitely something for kids to look at there. So now uh, Professor Kavanaugh has added on to our list. One is, is gerrymandering representation. The Senate obviously, I think, is a current topic of equality. Uh, obviously, affirmative action is still uh, uh, in the limelight there. Uh, so, in, you know, as we come to a close, first thing, I got to ask this question. I, I know I'm treading on, uh, you know, uh, very tender ground here. It seems to me that the number one problem we face is still systemic racism, that it was built into this country in its original founding, uh, which lasted four score in so many years. It then went another hundred years all right, in which it was embedded, both sexism and racism, embedded in the law there. Is that still, in your opinion, the biggest challenge? Or do you see other challenges of equality that have nothing to do with systemic? Or you don't even think systemic racism exists anymore, which is a valid point of view and a, a point of view that a lot of people uh, hold. So I'd like to go around the, the table here uh, uh, on that, and you can do either deal with my systemic question or identify a current problem uh, of equality that you think we need to address. Professor Williams. Uh, no, I agree with what you said. Um, I like to show my students like to think about the root causes of things, the systemic part of it, like an iceberg. And what you can see if you're in a boat is maybe you can see the tip of it, which is an event. And then below that, you maybe have some patterns that sometimes you see, but beneath that is still <laughs> the huge iceberg, right? And to the extent that we are trying to correct some of our events, some of the things we do, trying to recognize patterns, I think the systemic racism is still there. And I think, I think it is the most important issue we face. Uh, 
The only other issue I can think about that I think students should think about, and I think it could relate to systemic racism, and maybe it maybe there's an argument does it, is just um, the the fact that our our citizens in Washington D.C. Um, do not have representation, um, despite the fact that they are <laughs> citizens of the United States. So I think that that's an issue of equality that students should think about. And where it gets interesting is when we start thinking about this debate of whether DC should be brought in as a state, the other state that's brought up is of course, like maybe Puerto Rico should be brought in. And there, I'm just not sure. I don't know enough about the issue. I don't know if there is um, maybe a lot of Americans just in their sort of unconscious or conscious states just think, no, Puerto Ricans, they don't look like Americans and we wouldn't want to let them in. So that's not going to be a solution we're going to go to because we're just not going to let DC in. Um, but I think that statehood for DC is another one that, that students should think about. Professor Moore. Um, I can't help but think um, about some equity issues in our tax policies. Um, I guess I, which is another way of saying uh, maybe we need to get back to the, uh, the progressive idea of progressive taxation. Uh, I mean, s some of our tax policies are just so unbelievably regressive um, and have a, a draconian impact on people of lesser means. So uh, I, I would recommend uh, students maybe look into tax policies in, uh, and go back to the progressive era and, and read the, the explanations and justifications as to why a progressive tax rate is, is more fair uh, or equitable. That, that would be my recommendation. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, I, I, I keep thinking of this thing I saw on the Twitter machine, uh, partly because it was a photograph taken by a former professor of mine at Indiana University. Um, Will Counts as a young stringer. It happened to be uh, from Little Rock, Arkansas. And it was a little girl that was being harassed by a crowd. And uh, he took, Will, my, Will Counts took that photograph of, uh, Elizabeth Eckford, um, that's a very famous photograph with the, the white girls behind her yelling at her. And the caption was, the people that did this don't want us teaching in our schools now about what they did. And I think until we come to grips with the reality of our history and being able to teach our history warts and all to all of our kids, not to make the white kids feel bad, right? Not to make them feel guilty, to give them a sense of where we've been as a nation. Because as Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt said, if you, as a, you know, if you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? So I think that's, a, that's an issue for me, because obviously you see the people freaking out about, you know, critical race theory that is not taught in schools, but they think by actually, you know, talking about the history of the country, that somehow is going to be a bad thing. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with what happened out of the school board in Texas, where the woman was recorded saying, you know, opposing views to the Holocaust. And it's like, excuse me? Yeah, I was hoping you could send me some sources on that, Mr. Kavanaugh. You know, what are the opposing views as to the Holocaust? Uh, read Mein Kampf. I'll cover it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had, to, I had to do that. I just, yeah. You just had those moments uh, there. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, I said, I mean, so I think it, I think to to move us forward, right? We talked about this, it's, it's a process. Hank, as Hank said, it's a process. To move us forward, we have to talk about the real history of our nation from the, from the jump, right? From the jump through all the ugliness and through all the positive, right? So uh, that's, that would be my two cents. Professor Chambers. I, I, I agree certainly with what everyone has said. I want to particularly second what what Chris just said. One of the things that I that I like for students to do is to think about how the United States has changed just purely in size since 1787, 1788. And think about who has come into the union and what places have come into the union. So one example that I give is, is this. We, we in Virginia, of course, view ourselves as being a cut above all of you, uh, all of you people, because uh, we were first, that's the story. Uh, and obviously Jamestown was before the pilgrims. Uh, so <laughs> the idea is here, 
if you've lived in the same place for the last did it, did it succeed though did it succeed uh, I, I, <laughs> jamestown yeah J, yeah Ro, roanoke didn't they were in yes. north carolina but jamestown yeah yeah <laughs> we did that we did that so so the notion is well yes if if you've lived in your same place on your homestead for 400 years then man you you're awesome well if you've lived on the same homestead in Arizona for 400 years, sometimes you don't get treated as though you're awesome. You're treated as you're still an outsider. Parts of Texas, the same thing is true. As some folks have said, my family didn't move across the border, the border moved across us. So when you think about the United States of America and who is where and, and who is a part of us, just from a historical perspective, the concept of structural racism becomes sort of more real. When you think about how our Asian brothers and sisters were treated in California and in other places, when you think about how our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters are being treated now, yes, part of the United States, get to vote for president, no. In a situation where they are still at the mercy of what the government in Washington does, but certainly has no kind of power regarding Washington, even though if Puerto Rico was a state, it would be the 31st largest state in the union. So issues along those lines are, are, are pretty important. And thinking about our history and the fact that, yeah, we've done some pretty cruddy stuff. We haven't even gotten to the Trail of Tears. We haven't even gotten to moving Native Americans off of their lands. And yeah, I realize that that the vision of the Native, the Native American vision of property is different. Yeah, I understand all that, but the notion was never, hey, you get to move into this area that we, where we told you you could move. All of those things have got to make us think about what we want to do moving forward. We accept what we've done. We apologize. We recognize some of the good things we did over that time period. And now what are we going to do moving forward? And what does our vision of equality and equity look like? In that vein, let me throw out one thing that I hope that students read. Go to section two of the 14th Amendment. Read it and try to figure out what equality could possibly have meant in section one given what section two has to say. That's number one. And number two, read the 14th Amendment and ask if it says anything about women. That is, does the requirement of equality necessarily mean that we're talking about race or should it mean that we're talking about everybody? And ask that question and then go read Bradford versus Illinois. And how they said, yeah, women can't be lawyers, or at least states can say that women can't be lawyers. And then pull out some of your hair and try to figure out whether or not this, the, the talk about structural racism and whether it whether the US was founded on a chassis of racism, et cetera. Is it serious to argue that we weren't? Um, but all the while thinking about what can we do and what can we be in terms of creating a more perfect union. That's what it is we want students to do. That's what we want all of our citizens to do. Uh, and we wish we could have conversations five Bs at a time. And that, that might well be what the, what the fun would, would occur, even as folks have one eye on the Braves probably beating up on the Dodgers. <laughs> Quite possibly. Uh, I just, uh, and again, we've had a pretty eclectic range of equality issues uh, here. I would have never thought of uh, taxation. I appreciate that, Professor Moore. I want to throw one more in because I've been, uh, you know, thrown into this uh, you know, situation as a board member of a local company, and that is this idea of religious exemptions uh, to general laws and stuff. And and the more I thought about it, and then I read a Georgetown Law Review uh, article today. Uh, about this, and it, it to me, it's an equality issue. Uh, to what degree are religious groups or people of faith exempt 
from general laws and we can look at Oregon versus Smith and how the court decided on that uh, and maybe common good issues like uh, uh, vaccinations uh, there. But it seems to me that this court that currently sits is going to be very friendly to uh, uh, carving out more and more exemptions uh, to uh, uh, people of faith, predominantly within the uh, 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 Christian uh, faith there. And that begs the question of equality. Students, I am glad that you got to see a sign of Virginia exceptionalism uh, uh, there. Uh, he, uh, Professor Chambers is right on, on a few accounts uh, there, but uh, uh, generally, uh, I still think California would kick its butt in most anything uh, uh, there other than uh, good monuments to Confederate uh, uh, heroes uh, there. That's where Virginia takes California uh, in, in, that, in that conflict uh, there. It's been a joy. Covering this topic in one hour is nearly impossible. We, we did our best, and I'm sure we will revisit, revisit again. Uh, we will see you uh, in the future, uh, and we will address other topics of the Constitution. Until then, uh, thank you again, Professor Chambers. Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.